Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy, and I'm so pleased uh, to be here uh, again with uh, uh, Keiko Kroenke. Uh, thank you, Keiko, for uh, joining me, and uh, Catherine Pavlovich. Uh, thank you, too, for being here. And uh, what we want to do today, you're both um, uh, co-editors uh, of this wonderful book, Organizing Through Empathy. And what we wanted to do in this uh, dialogue today was to uh, talk about the book and uh, how the book came about, uh, talk about the introduction, and kind of get a little bit of an overview of the book. And before we do that, perhaps you could each uh, give a little bit of uh, introduction about yourself and your background. Perhaps Keiko, if you'd like to start. Sure. Okay. Uh, my name is Keiko Kranke. It's a Japanese first name and, and actually a German last name. So I consider myself a very international kind of person. And uh, I teach business ethics in the Mumford College of Business at the University of Northern Colorado. Um, empathy has been something that I have been living since I was a child. Um, I, I just came this way, I think. I have always been very sensitive to um, other people's suffering and animal suffering and I could as a five-year-old I could I worried about people who were hungry I worried about people who did not have homes I worried about pe dogs that were stray dogs so so this is kind of in my DNA and and I have always thought about empathy but I didn't really know how to go about writing about it or uh, how to express how I had felt and even teaching in business ethics I always feel like well yes it's important to teach my students r rules and regulations and you know what you're expected to do as future business leaders and so forth but but at the foundation if we could all uh, cultivate empathy a lot of the things won't be so necessary you know, even some of the rules may not be so necessary. If we could all, you know, every day uh, behave in a way that that um, it is in, in the way in that is in alignment with, you know, um, our values, which we care about others and care about the environment and care about the, you know, health of the organization and the society. Oh. So. Mm -hmm. So that, oh. that's how I feel. Sorry, it's a long introduction, but that's who I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. And uh, uh, Catherine, uh, about yourself? Yes, well, I'm uh, here in New Zealand, and I'm in the Waikato Management School. And Waikato is a Māori word meaning flowing river. So we're really we're the largest inland city in New Zealand and also um, one of the major business schools. And I'm in the Department of Strategy and I teach two courses, an undergraduate one which is self-actualizing leadership and my graduate course is conscious enterprise and they're both from a perspective of spirituality so my students kind of get to see you know a different way of looking at, at business and coordination and things like that and I guess um, you know Keiko has this wonderful, wonderful caring side for her that you can always see and witness. Um, my path into this is a little bit different. Um, I kind of, when I was growing up, I kind of, like most of us, didn't feel we didn't quite fit. You know, I think everyone's got that story, but we have different reasons. And for me, the physical world is something that's, that's important, but I can never... I never remember the facts and all that sort of rational behavior that we're told is really important. And I used to ask questions like, you know, what about the fairies and and things like that? And so I was always quite in, intuitive. Um, I'm really interested in fractals and you know how you, when you're a child, you put your finger on your eyes and you can see all these different patterns. So I was always interested in that space between us and, and and the, the world beyond the physical. And, um, but of course my, my Catholic upbringing suggested that there was only one way of seeing the world and to be able to look at different, maybe contemplative approaches was going to be a heretic and you're all going to go to hell. So <laughs> I never really explored that till later in life. Um, but, but it was through my academic career that um, I, I met Keiko through a mutual friend at, at the 
Academy of Man Management, which is our major conference, and we just started to have mutual interests and, and empathy was definitely a connecting point because for me, I know I'll talk about that later, it's all right, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, well great, thank you for those introductions and the, the book uh, Organizing Through Empathy, it's a, uh, it, the kind of the heading that really struck out to me is this book challenges the existing paradigm of capitalism by providing scientific evidence and empirical data that empathy is the most important uh, organizing mechanism. So uh, what we want to do is just hear about how did this book come about? You started uh, alluding to that, that you had met up and uh, that there was some kind of a connection around empathy, but I hear there was a, like an article that you worked uh, together on, Keiko. You'd mentioned that before to me. Right. Well, Catherine did a, a lot of work on that article. Uh, we have both felt that human organizations are not a box with, you know, separate individuals thrown in. So what makes a human organization a human organization, right? So, um, so we often talk about organizing and management which is often about, okay, how to put, you know, where to put these people in this department or, you know, how to assign these, you know, projects to these people. We kind of think of that as organizing, how to apply, you know, allocate resources. But um, the real organizing, what, what makes all these individuals connected to each other is empathy. So it's, it can be like a glue or something that connects us and that makes uh, an organization um, a more coherent whole kind of thing. So we are separate, but at the same time we're in interconnected and we can together become a whole and empathy is what makes it happen. So, mm. and that's, that's sort of what got started on that. Mm -hmm. So I, I was hearing there that there's, <laughs> there's kind of like a, you're saying that organizing can be done in maybe more of a directed way uh, versus a an empathic way, so kind of setting up those two different approaches. Is, was I hearing that correctly? Right. Well, in the mundane level, you know, you may see manager's job as okay, assigning tasks and you know, allocating resources. But what really makes a human organization or a group or a team a real holistic, you know, a whole is um, without empathy. Uh, we're not really, you know, we may lose the sense of connectedness. Mm -hmm. And so Catherine and I wanted to sort of elevate that notion of empathy from touchy-feely, oh, I understand how you feel, to so we brought the neuroscience evidence and also more um, um, quantum, you know, physics evidence to show that it's not, we're not separate particles, we're not separate beings, that, that, that we really are interconnected. And if I, I could just add to that, you know, if we, if we change our focus just from the physical world and we look at that space in between, and I think what fascinates me is the power of, of intuition or, um, uh, you know, just being able to pick up things before they actually happen. And I know in my life I've had heaps of experiences of that. And you ask most people and they you say, isn't it strange how you think of someone you haven't seen for years and then and then out of the blue you see them or they phone you or something like that. So it suggests, well, more and more suggestion that that that, that there is a there is there is a connectivity that's going on in that non-physical world, and we kind of know it. But what neuroscience and what quantum physics is doing now is giving us tangible evidence that this actually happens. And so, you know, the the understanding of neuro, mirror neurons and various other, you know, brain, you know, I think there are about 10 uh, empathy circuits in the brain that they understand at the moment. You know, we can now know that actually the thought process actually has a physical quality to it, even though we can't see it. So information is being transferred at that subatomic level. And and what we're suggesting, you know, and I know neuroscience is really new in this area, so it's a it's a big leap, but nevertheless it's really exciting. So what we're suggesting is that that vehicle of connectivity actually exists and what makes it strong is the power of empathy and it's empathy that actually connects us. And so uh, at, at an organising level, 
um, you know, it's it's not money that actually makes the world go right round. It's actually those those deep, uh, connective, kind, caring thoughts that we actually have to each other, and if we actually put more power into those, what type of world can we create? I, I just think it's such an exciting area and such an exciting way of actually trying to be. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I may have said this to you, Edwin, before, but uh, Jeremy Rifkin said that empathy really is the, the future invisible hand that's going mm. to save humanity. Mm. So, uh, you know, Adam Smith you know, talked about invisible hand as, you know, more of a financial um, uh, monetary terms, but but um, he's saying that in the future, empathy is, is going to what saves us, and I really do believe that. Mm -hmm. um, with all the technology available, um, you know, there may be some negative aspects to technology as well, but if we use it wisely, technology can connect us to people that we had never imagined before, right? Mm -hmm. And when something happens, we can know right away what other people on the other side of the planet may be experiencing, and we can reach out to help. And if we could, do, we could do that more and more and more, I really think that we can, it's not impossible. Um, just like John Lennon said, right? Um, imagine, you know, all the, all the people living as one, caring about each other. So it may sound a little ideal, but, you know, maybe too idealistic to some, but Catherine and I both have believed that it's possible. Uh, so you're really, I'm going to maybe reflect a little bit as we go along here. I empathically reflect, hopefully, see if I'm following <laughs> what you're saying empathically. So you're, you're saying that, uh, uh, well, first, Catherine, I was hearing that, that you were talking about kind of a more intuitive sense and that, that you can kind of sense other people kind of at this intuitive level and now that the neuroscience is, is showing how that intuition actually works through mirror neurons, that there is a physical... I mean, there is a sci sci scientific explanation for how that intuition works through uh, mirror neurons, and that we tend to maybe just look at this physical world, but there's this other kind of world that's kind of going on inside that works through mirror neurons and is kind of the, which are the basis of empathy. So, um, and then in, in Keiko, I was hearing that uh, you're looking at uh, kind of having kind of a vision of a, of a better world and that you're feeling that empathy is, is the way of, of getting uh, to that better world. I mean, that's kind of what I was hearing so yes. far. Am I yes. kind of getting that? <laughs> yes. There are yeah, lots I, of interesting points to, to further. Mm -hmm. And I, I, think, I think empathy is more than getting to the wor better world. It actually, it actually is fundamentally the way and you know, I, the whole notion of virtues and values and ethics has kind of not been that dominant in, in our business world, I guess, over the last mm. couple of decades. But you know, Aristotle said that a life, a, you know, living a good life is really important, and a life without good purpose is no life at all. And so, you know, for, for thousands of years, we've known this notion of doing good and however you want to define that, you know, is, is something significant and something that ha can help us transcend our current experience to, to be somewhere else or someplace else or some who else. Uh, and, and we're suggesting that these new sciences are really giving huge impact and power to this. And like quantum physics, for instance, and no one really understands it, but at the subatomic level, you know, the atoms can be in two places at once. I mean, they can bilocate. And so, again, that's another way of showing that, that power of, of, of feeling, I guess, mm. which, is what, which is what empty empathy is. It's that feeling of connection with another person or another physical or non-physical form um, is actually real. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, because in the business world that that feeling part has kind of been dismissed and you're wanting to, it sounds like, give feeling kind of its due and actually say that this empathic feeling is maybe a whole new organizing principle 
then we should kind of be basing, uh, you know, going forward on and that there's real hope. I'm hearing Keiko say there's a real hope that that can be kind of a way to a better future. Mm -hmm. How did the two of you come together in the sense that you had written an article together? What was that article titled and what was that about? That's how this book came about, as I understand. So the article was um, Empathy, Connectedness and Organizing. And it was published in the Journal of Business Ethics. And it, well, before that, we submitted it to the Academy of Management. And it got a Best Paper Award in the Management, Spirituality and, and Religion Division. And uh, Routledge said they really liked really liked what we'd submitted. So they actually approached us and asked us to write a book for them. Um, of course, Routledge is one of the top publishers, so we weren't going to say no. <laughs> and we spent quite a bit of time thinking about how we would write the book ourselves versus doing an edited book with other contributors. And finally, we did decide to have other contributors for a number of reasons. But I think the strength of the book is that um, there are some really quite different approaches coming coming through the book and beyond what Keiko and I would have been able to write about. And, yeah, and, and, and you know, it, it was a really interesting journey trying to put forward a call for papers, reviewing them, trying to think, my gosh, they're so, they're such a different, diverse selection of papers. How do we actually make it into a coherent volume? But it did come together, and we're really, really pleased with the the outcome. And the contributors all seem to be really delighted with it as well. So we're really excited about its potential. Right. And before that article, Catherine and I uh, co-authored a, a paper on you know how how to teach uh, management and business differently, right? Different kinds mm. of classroom activities that that may incorporate more contemplative practices and you know instead of teaching just to the left brain and the, the rationality but how can we teach the whole person so we wrote an article about um, you know basically teaching differently um, incorporating human values and and so Catherine wrote about how she teaches uh, incorporate certain projects in her classroom and I talked about how I bring poetry and art and mm. things like that into some business professors may look at us as you know like we're nuts but <laughs> but Catherine and I have have both dreamed about how we can teach people as as a whole person who is not mm. just a brain but who who has all these other other irrational parts, right? So that's how Catherine, Catherine and I came together. Well, the, I mean, the, the, the topic, you know, that you, you're kind of working, you have a topic of uh, transcendent empathy, which really resonates uh, for me because, you know, as a founder of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, that's what I also believe is that empathy can be this foundational human value that if we have these connections, that, you know, so much can kind of come out of it. Uh, you know, for just well-being, for problem solving, for innovation, and you're talking about a, a whole transcendent uh, transcendence of, of of way of using it for transcendent organizing and and kind of this human uh, way of uh, connecting. Um, I have the outline or the introduction here, and you start off with kind of an overview of the book, and then you went into contemplative approaches uh, with kind of one of the subheadings. Maybe we could just go through the different, some of the headings. Um, obviously, you started talking about that, Keiko, how you're, it sounds like you're kind of coming from a contemplative background. Uh, yes, both Catherine and I are, I, I think, right? We, we value... Um, reflection, contemplative practices, uh, meditation, and so we both bring that into our business classrooms. Mm -hmm. And um, my colleague and I, in my college actually, uh, we have been experimenting with uh, one minute meditation at the beginning of every class and see how students may feel differently at the end of the semester, uh, see how they would do better or worse on exams. And so, um, and then Empathy and contemplative practices do seem to be related, and based on our chapter contributors and and from other articles too. When we um, slow down and when we reflect, when we contemplate, it allows us to see 
all the other things that we may not be able to see in when we're just you know just using coming from a brain mode. Mm. Yes, and I I think that the studies that are coming out in neuroscience at the moment are showing are, are actually creating a new field called neurotheology, and the initial studies done were done with Buddhist monks, and they you know they they'd wire them up and do the functional MRI scanning. And that show that they physically demonstrate that through um, meditation, their happiness modes were were far greater up the spectrum than the normal population. And there's been lots of studies done since then that will keep confirming that if you are engaged in meditative practice or contemplative practices of some sort, you actually get different structural thickness. You know, which dampens the amygdala, which which lessens our anger, and all types of things. I mean, I know at UCLA they've got a mindfulness centre. Uh, the um, University of Massachusetts Medical School they've got a very strong centre there with Sarah Lars's work, and so the scientific evidence for me is absolutely overwhelming that contemplative practice actually increases empathy. Mm. And, you know, that's. I mean, and, and one of the interesting things that's coming out is, you know, the impacts of these different contemplative practice on different types of brain brain waves. And I know Fred um, Fred Travis and Dennis Heaton's work, who are some, one, some of the authors here, they can show that, you know, focused attention um, increases I think it's the alpha brain waves. Sorry, I can't remember the, yeah. the exact ones. You know, versus um, transcendental meditation, which increases the is it the gamma waves? I'm not sure, but but they've actually got evidence of the different practices and how they actually right. change the brain structures and the brain waves. So exciting! Mm. <laughs> well, you you also mentioned. I'm just kind of going through the. The introduction had a couple of subheadings, so I'm kind of go going through those. And one was, uh, after contemplative approaches, you talked about uh, applied empathy, and then you had some subheadings under applied empathy, and it was, uh, the first one was empathy and leadership. What was that about, uh, in terms of applied empathy, um, how it applies to leadership? Yes. So that was Veronica's uh paper and she takes a psychodynamic approach that looks on the impact of past experience on future behavior and she's got a case study which she talks about in quite a bit of detail and, and following the the impact of this very charismatic man and, and what he had on his organization and then the various um, empathic approaches and how that could could develop the organization or not so it's it's a it's a very specifically applied theoretical construct, you know, which again gives us a different ins insight and in, in how and how empathy can be used in a proactive way in an organisation. Oh, I guess I should have said I see how that um, that you have uh, actually several different parts to the book, and the first part is contemplative approaches, and then you have uh, four. Uh, articles or contrib chapters that are addressing the uh, contemplative approaches. So you have uh, consciousness and empathy in the brain as one, and then the source of empathy in our lives and exploratory journey into the realm of spirituality, and empathy, self, other differentiation, mindfulness training, and then it looked, there was a poem, I think, was number four. Yes, yes, that's correct, yes. And so um, both Dunia's work on spirituality and then Paul's work on mindfulness are very interesting. Um, Paul, I'm just trying to think. Um, the self-other differentiation that he talks about is, yeah. is a very theoretical paper and it's it's got a huge amount in, in it, and it, you really have to sit with that and really unpack what he's saying. But again, it's got the ability to really stretch our theory. Yeah. It's something like, you know, Edwin and I had a discussion about um, often empathy can be 
you know, we, we get sucked into, we lose ourselves, right? When you're, when we're feeling empathy towards um, others. So, so I think uh, in Paul's paper, he was talking about how we need to have clear differentiation between in self and other, and we need to have a, a clear foundation of who we are in order to uh, have healthy empathy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So it's that uh, quality in psychology that's talked a lot about as well in terms of for therapists that they need to have that differentiation versus kind of that merging quality that can happen within empathy. Um, I guess I should have uh, started with chapter one actually. So uh, I kind of were jumping around here. I, um, the, uh, con so chapter one was, uh, which is part one is contemplative approaches to empathy and chapter one is consciousness, empathy and the brain. So this is where transcendence and empathy are, are brought up. Uh, and that was by Dennis Heaton and uh, Fred Travis. Right. Do you want to say a few words about that chapter? I. So they're from the Maharashi Institute, so they do a lot of work around this in, in functional MRI scanning. And I really was referencing their work when I was talking about the different types of, of contemplative practice and, and how it creates different types of brain waves. So in some ways I've already mm -hmm. talked quite a bit about, okay. about their chapter. And, and they very much come from a perspective of transcendental meditation and the impacts that that has. So it's looking at transcend meditation, transcendental meditation, and kind of the effects on empathy and how empathy relates to that. Yeah. Um, is and then uh, is is there more around that, or should we move on to chapter two? Keiko, do you have anything think, to add? Mm, well, a lot of that was that you know what Catherine has already talked about, what happens in the brain and. Um, how meditation enhances empathy. And so a lot of that, you know, brain discussion was in there. Okay, great. Then number chapter two is the source of empathy in our lives and exploratory journey into the realm of spirituality. And this is about interpersonal attunement from a spiritual perspective and talks about attunement and religious perspective and about safety. Um, from a spiritual and religious perspective, any comments uh, or introduction of that chapter? So, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, so, she connected, yeah. Um, she used a lot of that um, work by, what's his name? Eckhart Tolle, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yes. And, she, and she identified four key conditions for empathy to, to emerge as source of empathy. So, um, and she made a really interesting connection between, you know, the sources of empathy and spiritual um, foundations. Okay, so then uh, chapter three you had empathy, self, other differentiation, and mindfulness training. We're still within the mindfulness, uh, right. uh, the development of a sense of self and others. Uh, self is is content and other as content. Uh, so it's quite a bit, quite a few bit in that. Um, mm. And it was, there was a heading there, why does mindfulness training improve empathy? So it kind of actually goes into maybe the, the nuts and bolts of how mindfulness uh, improves empathy. Yes. Any overview of that chapter? Or? I think we might leave that for Paul yeah. to explain. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> See. Okay. Well, uh, then we went on to uh, part two. You have chapter five, working through the past, how personal history influenced leaders' emotions and the capacity for empathy. Any comments about that? Catherine talked about this, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. I kind of jumped back. I was I didn't go systematically through, so I'm sorry about that. That's uh, so okay then. Uh, about the, yeah, e emotional insights. Yeah. And then chapter Did six is empathy. Yeah. Then uh, chapter six was empathy and a leadership uh, quintessential. Um, 
it has the nature of empathy and oh, it actually goes into some uh, different uh, leaders who exemplify, right. personify. Yeah, it's case studies, different leaders who actually demonstrated empathy. And, and so our intention of having this applied uh, perspective for empathy with, with leadership and then decision making is that you know we, we started off by looking at it at empathy from a, a new science perspective on how it can change our social structures and it can be an organizing mechanism. And this section is very much, you know, this is what you can do in an organization and this is what some leaders have actually done in organizations. So it's a more of a of a how to from a more of a practical perspective. Mm. So how to really how to do it within an organization? How some or, how some leaders actually did in, uh, yeah. incorporate empathy into their into their organizations. And as I remember, there was like different. There's kind of different angles on. It sounds like the leaders kind of used different approaches for how yes. they implemented empathy as well. That's right. Yes. 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 So Veronica's paper is more of a conceptual overview through one case study. And the, the second one, the quintessential, is look at, looking at practical benefits of empathy through leadership. And then we have uh, the second part, uh, two uh, B, is applied approaches to empathy and decision making. Uh, what is that about? And, and so we've, again, we've got two papers there that help us understand empathy. And the first one by um, Emmanuel and, and Jörg, they talk about um, the, the good approaches to empathy, but then when, when empathy can go wrong as well. And again, they've got that through case studies. And they also quite clearly make the difference or the separation between sympathy and empathy as well. Right. Um, it, I thought it was interesting that, that they talked well, in their presentation, too, they talked about the negative aspects of empathy, which I hadn't, you know, uh, really thought about. How, how could empathy turn, you know, go wrong in uh, decision, ethical decision making? But some of the examples are that some leaders can feel almost too much empathy for certain people, which may actually, you know, detract or take away from uh, feeling for other people. So um, it, it, I thought it was interesting. And there, there are ways to, to take care of that, I think. But, but um, well, I hope we can uh, do a. <laughs> sorry, there's a little bit of a lag. So sorry, speaking over you. Um, there was. Uh, I've been looking at that aspect too. You know, the the criticisms of empathy, and there was an article here in uh, the New Yorker by Paul Bloom where he went into some of the negative aspects of empathy. And I've been having a bit of a discussion with him, and have been interviewing people around that. So I hope we can uh, talk with uh, with uh, George, George and Emanuela. I think the authors is it, be, mm -hmm. about those because I really would like to look into and discuss uh, those uh, negative aspects because I think one of them that was mentioned was personal distress that if you empathize you can become distressed uh, there was like favoritism if you have empathy for one party you'll have less empathy you might may not have empathy for the other and uh, for me for example that is have a lack of empathy. If you have empathy for one person and don't have it for the other, it means we have to, it's not a problem of empathy, it's the lack of empathy for those people. Right. And we need right. to expand our empathy. So I would love to have a kind of a kind of a detailed discussion about uh, about those uh, qualities. And I think another negative was malicious empathy and then also using empathy to empathize with someone and then kind of manipulate them and say oh. like a I've talked to uh, Franz Duval about this. He always uses this story of uh, the used car salesman is using empathy to, you know, understand what you're wanting, and then their whole notion is to, uh, you know, sell you a lemon. So, you know, bad, which is a bad car, at least here in the United States. <laughs> I don't know what they call it in New Zealand. You see, I, I would actually question whether that is really empathy, because for me, this is 
it's a higher order. I don't know what to call it, but it, it's something at a higher order. Whereas if we're using empathy to manipulate, I don't actually think it's empathy. It's just I don't know. It's, it's, it's some other emotion <laughs> that you're using. Yeah. That's exactly how I feel too. It's like the empathy is the part where you're connecting. And the yeah. part where you're using manipulation is manipulation. So the problem yeah. is not with yeah. the empathy. The problem is right. with the manipulation. And right. then exactly. kind of empathy gets blamed for its lack. Yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, right. you. It, it's like it totally doesn't make sense to me, but it's 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 mentioned so often in in yeah. you know, among academics and whatever. I'm like kind of stunned by that. That so yeah. I, we're kind of really in alignment there, yeah. uh, Catherine. Absolutely. Yeah, to go into depth around that would be great too at some right. point. And another interesting issue may be human capacity, because when I talk about empathy, is like my students may ask me, well, how is it possible for us to be empath empathic all the time? You know, to all the employees, to all the you know every issue we deal with, and and how can you be empathic? How can you be mindful all the time? And so you know, I don't have a good answer to that, but I think it you know. How, how capable can we? It it's a human capacity issue. Um, because, and if you I know, can, apparently it gets, yeah, empathy gets blamed if we forget to empathic, not as empathic to some people as we could be to other people, right? If I can also add to that too, um, you know, I think being empathic isn't always about saying yes to everybody all the time. You know, it, it's right. it's. Um, it's like being spiritual. Sometimes being spiritual is having the moral courage to actually stand up and say these things are not right, and you have right. you know a certain challenging decisions right. that have to come out right. of that. Right. That's and I, I think the same can be applied with mm -hmm. empathy. It's not oh I love you all the time. I mean right. you do on right. the heart level, mm -hmm. but there are there are other decisions that need to be made mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for true yeah. empathy for transcendence to occur. Right, and that so one of the issues may be that um, people's definition and understanding of empathy only stopping at the heart level, maybe. So a lot of people may think that that empathy may be oh feeling, feeling oh feeling I feel for you, you know. Um, so excuse me. So maybe uh, we should keep promoting the more elevated, you know, empathy. Mm -hmm. It's more than just feeling more than just you know emotions um, yes. as what you said I love you or I care about you sometimes emotion may be to to not say those things right yeah. well I remember reading somewhere in the book the difference between sympathy and empathy in the sense that just feeling for someone in that sense can be just sympathy can be sympathy which kind of takes out of the empathic connection and then the other part that I've been seeing is when we have empathy, and I would think the transcendent empathy is that, that you may empathize with someone, but you also empathize with yourself in the sense that you are right. also to be empathized with, and then it's an empathic relationship, so it's kind of requesting that the other person empathize with you as well. So if you're making those right. difficult decisions, it's a matter of being heard about the difficulty you're having as well mm -hmm. by others. It's just yeah. not this one thing that we go and empathize with everybody else right, and don't right. get it, uh, be heard ourselves. So that's kind of how I kind of yeah. look right. at that. Yeah, right. Thank you yeah. for reminding me. I often forget that empathy uh, is not just going from us, going one way from us to others, but you know, empathy is includes self empathy too. So we can't just you know give and give and give and feel for other people all the time. We are, have our own needs to be empathized and to be heard and to be understood. So, and um, self empathy is, I think it's crucial. If we don't have self empathy, I don't think we can truly empathize with other people. Yeah. And I, and I think that empathy, particularly as you said, the transcendental empathy is reciprocal. There is a, a, a two way thing there, as opposed to sympathy, which right. is. Oh, I'm really sorry for you, but you're really just thinking about. Thank God, it's not me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it's a lot more just a a, a, a me-centered, an ego-centered mm -hmm. um, right. And I almost hear a little bit of a condescending kind of thing in sympathy, 
Right. I, I'm in a separate place, and I sort of I feel sorry for your misfortune. Or yeah, that's yeah. how I hear it too. Like it's like it's yeah. something that's looking down. There seems to be two versions of sympathy that I've been seeing. One is that one that you're talking about, like, oh, poor you, you're suffering. You know, glad I'm not suffering, and and I'm going to let you know <laughs> that uh, you know, poor you. And the other is the sympathy of like someone said, oh, maybe the story is. Uh, someone comes and says, oh, my mother died. And you say, oh, poor you, you know, I see you're suffering, you know, I feel sorry for you. But then the other, that seems to be one version of sympathy. And another version seems to be uh, that, oh, guess what, my mother died too. And I had such a hard time when my mother died. So it kind of takes the attention away from hearing the other person, empathizing with them fully, that it takes the attention back uh, to you and it starts becoming about your story at that point. So that seems to be the two versions of sympathy that I've, I've noticed. Mm -hmm. And, that, and the latter, of, latter one almost seems like empathy, but yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Now while you're talking, I'm, I'm also thinking of the, the, the difference between the, the Western versions of, em of empathy and the Eastern versions. And, and most of the literature on empathy is like, compassion, you know, we're, we're looking out for someone suffering. Whereas the, the Eastern, the Buddhist philosophy of compassion slash empathy is just this open-heartedness you feel to all, to all beings, regardless of what state they're at. And possibly we possibly could have paid that more on the book, I think, in, in reflection. Um, but it's, it's, it's just a state of being rather than a, a picking up of others' emotions, does that make sense? Which is what I see more in the Western approach, organization approaches anyway. So, so, so for, me, for, me, for me, I guess empathy is more that trying to be in that open-heartedness space. Uh, so the empathy is like an open-hearted kind of openness to, and the other version of is the other way is I didn't quite catch that. There's an open-heartedness quality where you're kind of open-hearted to all and to life, and then and, the other. And so, in the academic literature, um, when when people look at empathy and or compassion, which of course are similar but different, it's really about looking at times of distress in an organisation mm -hmm. and how to relieve mm -hmm. suffering. Whereas from a a Eastern perspective, you know, it's it's not yes, it is suffering, but it's more about just being open-hearted, no matter what the conditions. Well, that's my view of empathy as well. In terms of empathy, is empathizing with all feelings, all experiences, and not just that slice of experience that's uh, the suffering. And mm -hmm. you hear with Buddhists, it's like life is suffering, and all you know. So there's a real focus on the suffering part. And uh, for me, what I like about empathy is that broad sharing of all, you know, sharing your joys, sharing your creativity, sharing your insights, yeah, exactly. sharing your sorrow, you know, the full yeah. spectrum. And I think maybe that's what you're addressing yeah. is that the empathy yeah. has that full spectrum connection. Yes. Yes. No, I, I like that because, because that's, because all, all experience is about us learning. And that's how we transcend as a, spe as a humanity. Right. Uh, while you're talking, I was thinking about um, sort of the Western Eastern difference in empathy. And maybe the Western approach may have that tone that I, um, I wish we could change it. You know, so mm. I, I, mm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I wish I could. Mm. I, mm. I, but maybe the Eastern approach is that like see it as is not necessarily changing it. So that yeah. may be one of the differences that kind of came to my mind. Yeah, that's a, one that's problem. Good. I've I've talked with uh, people like Dan Batson who's, you know, been in the you know, reference slides work been working on empathy for, you know, 25, 30 years. And he 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 and he had a chapter in a book where he laid out the different ways that empathy is used. And he had at least eight ways that the word is used and it causes a lot of confusion and he says there's no right way it's just but that before starting a discussion it's good to always lay out 
how mm -hmm. you're using the word and kind of like stick to mm -hmm. it. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there is kind of this confusion, these these subtle differences in terms of how the word uh, gets used. And I've come across that a lot and talked to people like um, uh, Paul Ekman, uh, who's written you know, about compassion. And he said, oh, it's a minefield out there with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, well, you know, with empathy and compassion too, for that matter, around definition. So mm -hmm. we always that always comes up. Mm. That's a good point. So um, maybe chapter eight was the ACES decision making technique is a reframing tool for increasing uh, empathy. Uh, any comments about that? Well, this again is, a, is an applied approach to decision making, and it's a, a step by step process that you can actually engage with. And the A stands for um, looking at your assumptions. The C is looking at uh, set criteria. The E is an evoked set of how you're going to start to reframe those assumptions and the, and the criteria. And the S is the, the strategy of going forward. So it's, it's, it's a structured approach to try and look at reframing to increase empathy. Mm. Okay, any comment on that, uh, Keiko, or should we move on? I, I, I thought it's an interesting technique, you know. Um, that, that's the only chapter that actually gives, you know, he, here's a, is a tool that you could use kind of thing. So, so I thought that there's some value to including a chapter like that in the book. Great. So uh, then you will go on to part two, uh, section C, applied approaches to empathy contextual. And chapter nine was uh, um, uh, predicting empathy in the medical students and doctors. Yeah. And, and so this section is yeah. having, um, so with very, very specific context where empathy is applied. and. And so sports arena and medical students, I mean, that's really, really interesting to get a completely different perspective. Mm -hmm. And in the, and, and, um, in Don, Don et al's chapter, you know, they're just saying, they're just asking the question is, is it possible to actually screen medical students right at the beginning and, and identify how much empathy they have? And that's not to eliminate them from the program. It's just to suggest that if they are, do suffer from what um, Baron Cohen talk, talks of empathy erosion, maybe there are ways that they've been developed further through their training. And I mean, you know, it, it's such a, a caring profession that to be able to have empathy, I think, is really important. So it's just a really interesting way of looking at it. Right. Yeah. It's one one way to. They may actually decide to deselect some of those students who have very low empathy. Um, what's interesting to add is that I read an article outside of this chapter that that uh, most doctors and nurses tend to have low empathy when they're practicing because they cannot really be feeling empathy every time they give a shot to someone. So they need to kind of turn it off. And then when they, they interact with patients, they have to turn it back up. So it's like, you know, <laughs> so they need to have a mechanism of increasing their empathic response and decreasing it. So I, I thought that that was very interesting. So I don't know how that would fit into, so gauging the level of empathy in future medical students. Uh, so it's really about this kind of uh, focusing, having a kind of a, a, a scope of looking at the empathy within a specific field of, of medicine then and kind of looking at medical students, which I've heard also from other sources that third year the empathy students come in, third year the empathy starts crashing mm -hmm. and there's yeah. you know arguments for that. And I have a book, it's on the side here, uh, the one that I'm kind of pointing to, it's called uh, From Detached Concern to Empathy, and it's by Jody Helper, and she's a, a psych, uh, psychiatrist at, um, um, at uh, UC Berkeley, and uh, she's written specifically a book about From Detached Concern to Empathy in the Medical Field, so it's humanizing medicine, so there's a lot of literature around this, so you're it's great that you're kind of addressing that specific yeah. area um, mm -hmm. 
within the medical field. Uh, then chapter 10 is the caring client uh, climate, how sports environments can develop empathy uh, in young people. And so Laurie uh, applies a F African ethic of Ubuntu, which is really, really interesting in the sports environment. And I love this explanation that she she quotes here. Is Ubuntu is described as my humanity is caught up, is an inextricably bound up in yours. We belong in a bundle of life. I am human because I belong. I participate and I share. And I I just love that. And I guess you know they use the word Ubuntu, but for me that's that's actually what empathy is. It's that that oneness that feeling of unity and to be able to apply this within a um, sports context with, with young people I think is a really powerful way and I'm very excited about this approach because it, it um, sorry our fire alarm is going uh -huh. off, uh -oh. <laughs> because it, it shows that we can actually create change with young people. I might have to go. Uh oh. <laughs> Is that? I, just one thing though, before I do leave, um, it's probably just a false alarm, but I, I will need to go. Yeah. As, as I think the climate change that we're experiencing now is showing a new, a different side of humanity where we are coming together, and I'm sure you would have seen this, Keiko, and I've seen it in New Zealand with our earthquakes where communities are. Yeah coming together and actually experiencing empathy on a new level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, with sorry. that, we, yeah, you I'm, better go. I'm okay, worry okay. about your safety. So. <laughs> okay, lovely okay. to talk with you, right. and thank you for doing Great this. Great to you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Wow, that was a dramatic okay. end. <laughs> I just wanted to add that this is a chapter that really kind of um, talks about what we were talking about before. It's not an individual thing. How we can, it's a cultural, you know, how, how we can create the culture and team-based approach and, you know, how as a team we can create an um, empathic culture kind of thing. So I think this chapter really relates to the discussion that we had before. Mm -hmm. So it's really about, um, like in a team, like a sports team, you know, the the team has to build that uh, connection with right. each other, and I, and um, he uh, right. see Laurie talks about all the ways that you can do that team building. You know how and how do you create that sense of inclusion and right. acceptance and and that caring, that sense of caring, right. and and how do you kind of build that mm -hmm. team? You know, everyone's working together and feels included, and and uh, I think it was even something about you know if you, maybe if if some of the team members are having personal problems, that there's a space for them to kind of work that through within right. Right. within that community. So that was a really nice chapter. Right. And a team is a microcosm of a society. So if we we can understand how you know we, we can create empathic culture in a team, we can apply that to a society and maybe you know work on larger. Um, macrocosm, you know, microcosm. Mm, so the, the approaches and methods could be used kind of for the whole world kind of team in a sense like that, for all of humanity is it maybe like a team. I, I think so. Yeah. Right, because as I was reading this chapter, uh, when you were editing all these chapters, I kept thinking, wow, wouldn't it be nice if the whole planet, whole country could work as one giant team that you know we can create um, that kind of um, uh, dynamics. Yeah, the, the what came out of that chapter uh, for me was was that as well, but also in terms of there is kind of this part about empathy in teams, and then teams have that in group, and then it becomes the out group. And how do you kind of deal with that in-group, out-group right. kind of quality and transcend? Because I think with the transcendent empathy, you're really looking at how do you transcend, uh, you know, all that in-group, out-group, and make it kind of one. As Catherine was talking about, that one open-heartedness and that open, uh, transcendent right. empathy. Right. And what's interesting now with all the social media and all the technology that connects us, 
so we can each be connected to another uh, team you know it can be a virtual team and I have heard some very interesting stories about how uh, Facebook groups even have come together to make something happen or fundraise for a cause or maybe there's some uh, criminal out there and they all communicate with each other to get this guy you know caught and mm -hmm. so uh, and then it's kind of like a overlapping different kinds of teams working so so it's not such a stretch to think that that can be applied to the whole planet whole world right because that all these um, sort of interconnecting uh, overlapping teams and groups Mm -hmm. So finding a way that these teams that are out there, how they can connect with each other and and kind of create more of that transcendent connection between teams. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're meaning? Right, right. Between teams. And it's not just separate teams, but some of the teams are overlapping because there's oh, the same mm -hmm. people in it. Right? I see. So, uh -huh. so even when you take a team of very cohesive team, but each person may have a connection with other teams, other groups, maybe virtual groups, and and that's that's where my hope is. Oh, uh, for that connection between multiple groups, if we're connected just to one, not just to one group, but if we're connected to multiple groups, that that kind of creates right. a sense of connection between those different right. groups. Then, right, and 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 that's how possibly and empathy could spread almost almost like a virus you know because we're all part of a different group right so if we sort of start to, to cultivate that kind of culture in each group it can it can spread as faster than we might we might think mm. well that brings us to the uh, last chapter which was transcendent empathy the ability to see the larger system and that was a chapter that you uh, co-authored with uh, Peter Peter uh, Seng is that how you pronounce the, and uh, we did it. We already did it. Sengi, Sengi, and we did an hour-long right. uh, present uh, mm -hmm. discussion on that, which I hope we'll do with some more of right. these chapters. Right. Um, so there, you're talking about. I think that's really the core of the book. Is is that transcendent empathy? It's like how do we come to that uh, where empathy is like a a foundational cultural value. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, I mean, that's how I'm kind of seeing it. And I, that's where kind of my hope is. Right, right. And, and I would like to expand that, too, because even after we wrote that chapter, um, I'm trying to see how empathy can play a role in so many different, well, we talked about this design, you know, a principle is one of them. And people may not have connected empathy and design before, right? And, and design. In just so many areas, not just in business, but um, I was talking with a professor in nursing, and they are talking about how to instill more empathy in nursing future nurses, you know, nursing students. Um, so um, I, I think that we can really transcend and empathy can can be broadened. Well, that's what my hope and dream is uh, as well. I did just hear an interesting. Uh, an article that I read about uh, mediation, that empathy is really the foundation of mediation, but there's two versions exactly. of this mediation, yeah. that there's one version of mediation where two parties are seen as uh, separate entities that are using like minimal empathy to kind of transcend their, argue, their, their differences but still maintain that sense of, of self-interest. It's like Right. And that's like a one version, and then there's another version of empathy where the empathy itself is the, what we're looking at is the quality of our relationship. Oh, okay. That the, the relationship, we're wanting a relationship that values the empathy, that empathic connection, and the quality of that connection. Right. And for me, that's more the transcendent empathy that you're talking about. It seems like to me, maybe, I mean, I can just check, that you're looking at the is the, the depth of that quality of that connection and that is really what's valued between the with between the individuals is how can we have that uh, and the valuing of that connection between each other versus just like what can I kinda what's the minimal empathy I can put in here just to get my needs kinda met right. which re yeah. yeah yeah so in my next writing I'm really I really would like to define what transcendent you know 
what, what does it mean to be transcending, right? So in the chapter, we said that it's feeling, making the deep connection in time and space. So you empathize with the future generations that we that do not exist yet. So how do we behave in in such a manner mm. that um, that will create some goodness for seven generations in the future? Peter Senge actually said that the way we have been sort of exploiting the environment, uh, he said that some young person said it's kind of like. Um, uh, you drank your own juice, and you drank ours too. Mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So it's well, almost like we're using our resources, and we're using almost the future resources that belong to the future generations. So, so transcendent empathy. So one definition of transcendence is that feeling empathy with or towards or for someone that does not even exist yet. Or an, and another part is the people that you have never met. So we tend to often feel empathy for your own country people or the people who have the same religions or your family members. But how can we stretch our empathy to people who may have a different religion that you may not agree with? Can you still feel empathy towards people you know, who may do certain things that you may not agree with? or? Um, people you have never met before. Well, we you go into that in quite a depth in the interview that we did, so that is also available and we will be doing some interviews with uh, some of the chapter uh, authors as well. Uh, so this is just our first version, our first uh, introduction to right. the book and we will be going into more depth yes. in, in each chapter, so I'm looking forward to that. Yes. So Each of the chapters. Yeah, so is there any final thought? Uh, you have before we yep. uh, close? Who's... Well, I'm talking with you, dialoguing with you, um, really deepens my um, interest even more to do more research on empathy and writing more about it. So, so, and also make, makes me realize that, oh, how little I know. There's so much more to learn about um, around empathy. So, thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to do this. Yeah, and thank you so much for both of you to uh, to bring empathy into the workplace to really kind of articulate how it can be done. Because I think that's uh, you know if we can if we can do that, it's a great contribution to really turning society around. If we can bring empathy into organizations in in general, so uh, thank you for all your the work you're I, I doing. Hope so. <laughs> yes, in many people's mind, empathy and business may still be very unlikely partners. But I hope in the future that they won't be so unlikely. <laughs>